Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Darden, my dear friend Bill, for your kind words. Um, I also thank all of you for your uh, interest in attending this lecture and discussion that we are going to have. Um, I also must say that uh, I am very proud of being associated from now on more openly to the Oxford Internet Institute, which is one of the most innovative institutes in this area of study in the world. I'm very proud to continue being an author of Oxford University Press uh, because, in fact, this is my second book with Oxford University Press. And yes, this is, I would say, after I finished my trilogy, I thought that I wouldn't have uh, the energy or the time to uh, undertake a major project. I have published several books, but on uh, projects more limited. And this is really my big project of the last seven, eight years. Uh, which uh, took a long time and a long effort. In addition, because the topic of my research, very much like happened with my trilogy, was running away ahead from me. Uh, the more I was trying to understand the dynamics between new communication uh, environments and uh, power making, the faster the environment was changing, the more new technology were appearing, and the, the, the social and political landscape was being transformed. So at one point, I decided that I had to finish the book, uh, but it by, by no means is the, the end of uh, my interest on the topic because as I hope that uh, I will be able to convey uh, in this lecture, I do think this is a fundamental topic, not just specialized in communication, not just specialized in politics, on power analysis, but in terms of the future of our societies and the future of democracy. So, let me try to, to summarize the, um, the, um, the essence of what I have to say in this book that uh, my wonderful editor David Masson uh, evaluates at about 600 pages so that uh, probably uh, will, will uh, be difficult to do but I will do my best. Let's start from the beginning. Um, Power relationships, in my view, are the foundation of social organization in all societies. And throughout history, communication and information it had been fundamental sources of power and counterpower, of domination and social change. And this is because, ultimately, the fundamental battle is the battle over the minds of the people. The way we think determines, to a large extent, the way we act. And therefore, uh, if people, the way people think ultimately determines the fate of the values, norms, and institutions on which societies are founded. I will try to be as non uh, uh, definitional as possible in the lecture, but let me just give you one definition, definition of power, at least my definition of power, so that we at least can uh, uh, know where I come from in terms of this analysis. For me, uh, and I'm not innovating in this, it's a, I would say it's a very standard definition of power, is power is the uh, relational capacity that enables a social actor to influence asymmetrically, that's important, the decisions of other social actors in ways they, that favor the empowered actors' will, interests, and values. Now, power is exercised by means of coercion, or the possibility of it, and or by the construction of meaning on the basis of the discourses through which social actors guide their action. So, yes, it's force there, the, the, the possibility to use force, but it's also the construction of the discourse that shape people's action and the combination in every situation of both processes. Power relationships are framed by domination, which is by the power that is embedded in the institutions of society. Let's say uh, domination is crystallized power in the institutions of society. 
And the relational capacity of power is conditioned, although not determined, by the structural capacity of domination institutionalized in society. Now, where there is power, there is always counterpower, and that's extremely important to assert, because the, if I would reduce um, the, the law of society to just one law, one force, uh, in terms of a, a, the forceful idea, that would be that wherever there is domination, there is resistance to domination. And therefore, all societies are constructed on power relationships which are always uh, conflictive and that are always in competition. Then I also would say, uh, as an introductory statement, that while coercion and fear are critical sources for imposing the will of the dominance over the will of the dominated, few institutional systems can last long if they are solely based on sheer repression. Torturing the bodies is less effective than shaping the minds. And ultimately then, uh, the capacity to shape the minds is what is the fundamental foundation of power. Now, if we say that, the, if the production of meaning, the shaping of the production of meaning is a fundamental source of power, the key source for the production of meaning is the process of communication, because that's how people build their ideas, their images, and their own discourses. Defining communication as the process of sharing meaning on the basis of information transfer. Therefore, the battle over, over the human mind, which conditions the battles of power, is largely played out in the process of communication. And this is particularly so in the network society, the social structure of the information age that I try to analyze in my works, which I will not come back to this analysis trying to build on that, because the network society, the social structure that characterizes the network society, is uh, characterized by the pervasiveness of communication networks in a multimodal hypertext. And so the ongoing transformation of communication technology in the digital age extends the reach of communication media to all domains of social life in the network that is a network that is at the same time global and local, generic and customized in an ever-changing pattern. And as a result, the overarching thesis is that power relationships are increasingly shaped and decided in the communication field. And so are counterpower relationships, so that these dynamics between power and counterpower are fundamentally played out in the communication field. But this is a general statement that I would actually uh, extrapolate throughout history, but uh, I will focus on the analysis in our current social structure. So I will try to analyze the specificity of the relationship between communication and power in the network society, in our social structure. Um, this analysis that I will try to summarize in the main ideas is uh, based on evidence, uh, and for the most part, except that I will try to go directly to the ideas, to the results of the analysis, and I led you the uh, work to look at the evidence. Um, the evidence is certainly presented in my book, but don't believe me, please buy the book. <laughs> Let me start the easy way with uh, recalling some of the key interactions between communication and politics in the most traditional way. The relationship between mass communication and media politics. Power making being based on socialized communication, uh, that means on the capacity to uh, influence people's minds. Then the main channel of communication between the political system and the political processes 
and citizens is the mass media system. First of all, television. Uh, by the way, the, the, what the study shows that television is the most credible, even today, the most credible medium for one simple reason. If you see it, it's true, right? Well, uh, as you know, editors can make incredible images out of uh, their work, but anyway, people continue to think that you see it, that, that's it, you don't need anything else, even in the age of digital editing. In our society, it's, um, we can actually sustain that politics is primarily, not only, but primarily media politics. The materials of the political system, therefore, are staged for the media, so as to obtain the support of, at, or at least the lesser hostility of citizens who had become fundamentally consumers in the political market. Now, this does not mean that power is in the hands of the media. Uh, that's for several reasons, because media are plural, because they are internal controls in terms of their capacity to influence the audience. The fundamental thing we have to remember is that media are fundamentally business. So, uh, and, and, or they are political media, in both cases the same, they need to attract the audience. The fundamental thing, the fundamental rule is to attract the audience. Um, and therefore they, they have to be credible, they have to be entertaining, they cannot be pure propaganda machines. They have to be subtle propaganda machines, but of different sources of propaganda, of different sources of mind shaping, because societies are plural, even in authoritarian societies, there are different uh, segments, there are different interests, there are different values, and in addition there is a, a filter established by the uh, professional work of journalists and, and media managers who are professionals, who are not free but are not completely slaves, and so it's a much more complicated system that saying the media have the power. The media don't have the power, they have something much more important. The media have uh, they, they have become the space of power. Power is played out in the media and therefore whoever wants to exist in the political game has to go through the media which gives to the media extraordinary capacity to shape the debate, to influence the debate, but for a plurality of power sources and that capacity is what keeps them in business because everybody needs the media and therefore they don't have to align necessarily themselves with one or the other. A footnote to that, by the way, is that it's not always the case because if we keep in mind media are business, there are some different business models and there is one important recent business model in the last decade which is the rise of what people call militant journalism. Uh, an easy example to understand, uh, Fox News in the United States but other, I could cite many other media in, in the rest of Europe, media set in Italy or a thing like that. Um, Fox News in the United States decided very clearly play an ideological medium, just to defend certain ideological positions, uh, banking on the fact that all the studies show that people read the media or watch the media that confirm their opinions. They don't try to learn through the media, they try to be confirmed through the media. So, if you become clearly, uh, absolutely, an expression of right-wing conservative ideology and political positioning, you corner a big chunk of the market, in the United States, 25%. And therefore, well, you know, in a, in a world of fragmented media, in a world of diversified audiences, if you have 25% of the market, you can build from there. And then, at, at the same time, uh, Mr. Murdoch will give donations to the Democrats, actually to Hillary Clinton was one of the main receivers of donations, because it keeps the options open, of course, and lately he's a great supporter of Obama. So it's, uh, uh, it, it really moves from one uh, point to another. The main issue, therefore, is not the shaping of the minds by explicit messages in the media, but the general shaping of the mind of, by all messages in the media. And the most important thing is the absence of a given content in the media. I mean, it works, the system works in a binary system. You exist in the media, you are not in the media, you do not exist. So more important than what is said, is, is more important than that, is what is not said. 
uh, what you don't see. Because if you don't see it in the media, you still can have a fragmented, individualized public opinion in, among certain individuals, but as a so socialized communication process, as a public mind, let's say, to use the word, as a public mind, you don't exist if you are not in the media. So a political message is necessarily a media message. And what does it mean? Well, it means that it has to be couched in the specific language of the media. The need to format the message for the media has all kinds of consequences in terms of uh, how you can relate to society through this message, particularly in television, but not only as we will see in a moment. The language of media has its rules. It's largely built around images, not necessarily visual, but the kind of impact that our brain processes as images in the neuroscientific sense. The simplest message is in politics is a human face. And therefore, media politics leads necessarily to personalization of politics. The product you sell is a person, not a program, not a proposal, not a position. Uh, because people don't read political programs. Uh, you don't read the political platforms of the party you voted for. You read the headlines when you read. Uh, you, you follow more or less what you, your feelings are and there are some major debates, but even on the major debates, you trust or you don't trust the message depending if you trust or you don't trust the person. Now, the human face is not just the, the, the dress uh, or the color of the tie or how people look. Uh, in fact, studies show that uh, for a candidate to be handsome is usually more negative than, than, than positive because most people don't identify uh, with that <laughs> handsomeness. Uh, so, except of course in the case of extraordinary beauty like Sarah Palin, but that's, that's a, an exception in politics. Um, now, it's, um, but the key thing is the character, is because the key relationship in politics, in our kind of politics, in our society, is trust. And trust is built on character, is built on the, the history of the person, the biography, the attitude, uh, what the person is able to communicate. Now, Part of the personality politics uh, trend is related to the evolution of the electoral politics. Usually elections or political processes at large are decided in the middle, among the independents, among the people who are uh, uh, hesitant in terms of ideological positions, and these are the people who are less receptive to extreme ideological messages or clear ideological messages and more receptive, on the contrary, to the uh, relationship, the personal relationship inspired with a person. So it's not that issues are not real. They are. But as George Lakoff writes, issues are real as are the facts of the matter. But issues are primarily symbolic of values and trustworthiness. And we know that political um, decisions are inspired by values and emotions. The entire realm of uh, and the communication, uh, political communication, communication psychology in, in the last years shows um, that emotions drive political behavior much more than any other thing. Emotions lead to feelings, feelings lead to the uh, uh, political decision making, as of, as in fact, to all kinds of decision making, a number of neuroscientists like Antonio Damasio and others, or cognitive science like George Lakoff have been working on this for years and now there is an ample uh, uh, body of research supporting in terms of political science and political communication this uh, hypothesis from uh, psychology and neuroscience. Therefore, character as portrayed in the media becomes essential because values, which is what matters most for the majority of the candidates are embodied in the persons of the candidates or in the persons of the leaders once they are in office. It's the same process. Politicians, therefore, are the faces of politics. Now, if credibility, trust and character become the critical issues in deciding 
uh, power strategies, the most potent weapon of political conflict is the character assassination strategy. If you eliminate the credibility, the trust of the opponent, then you win. So you, you win by propelling enthusiasm for your candidate, but fundamentally by destroying the character that is the alternative. Why attack politics has become prevalent all over the world, not just the United States, which is in fact in many ways an exception in terms of the political system. Um, very simple. Experiments based on MRI studies show that people react six times more uh, to negative messages than to positive messages. And some scientists think that this is in fact wired in our brain through evolutionary uh, uh, transformation of, of the brain. If you see a dinosaur, you better run. Those who didn't, uh, didn't continue. Uh, uh, so danger, negative things, uh, immediately are recorded and you react to that much faster than positive uh, uh, connotations that require elaboration, that require to build a whole ideological system of evaluating and making judgment, etc. So the more you go into the instinct, basic emotional reaction, the more you uh, believe in attack politics. Therefore, media politics and personality politics lead to a fundamental tool of political action uh, in the last uh, 20 years, uh, which is scandal politics. Is uh, what John Thompson and many other scholars like Williams and de la Carpini, Thunberg at the City University of London, Esser and Hartung or Lives and Blumkalka in Germany, a whole series of studies that show how scandal politics has dominated politics. Uh, I know that in, 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 in the UK there are no scandal politics. Mm, I, I don't think that this guy Osborne has any importance, no? But uh, looks like uh, you have, you are kind of a scandal politics uh, in ways that uh, people don't uh, recognize often. But I did with my best doctoral student at the Edinburgh School, Emilia Arsenault, we had built a, um, we have compiled political scandals uh, in, throughout the world with emphasis particularly on Western democracies for the last 20 years. And it's just simply extraordinary. The number of governments had fallen, regimes have fallen, political leaders had fallen. Always, always, the, the, the main direct reason for the defeat had been political scandals. This is the most important political phenomenon, the most important political weapon. But we have to understand why. And, and the why is the mechanism that I tried to uh, present, and which, of course, uh, determine the type of politics that is uh, uh, propelled through the media, which is not just political campaigns. Political campaigns in the United States are important, but most countries are not very important. In, in, in Spain, it's literally not important, a political campaign. So th these are not the issues. The issue is the campaigning every day, is what happens every day, what happens in the news, what happens in the, in the media every day and not simply uh, every four years. The, however, scandal politics, if we look at it in, from the point of view of the scholarly evidence, uh, don't have necessarily the intended effect by the person in the scandal. First of all, everybody practices a scandal politics, everybody. Uh, and everybody is prepared for a scandal politics. Why? Because if you know that this is coming, you are going to be prepared the same way. So you have your arsenal of scandal politics weapons, just in case. Even if you are a good guy and you don't want to do attack politics, you will do, you get ready or you don't play politics. Um, as, as Hillary said very rightly to Obama in the campaign, you cannot uh, get the heat of the kitchen, get out of here. Um, well, that means that, uh, that you have to be ready to be as dirty as the other guy. Then you are or you are not, that's a different thing. But you have to be ready. Therefore, therefore, there is a, extra, everything that happens in our societies 
creates a market, creates a market, sometimes a virtual market as we have seen, uh, it creates a market and therefore you have immediately all kind of intermediaries uh, finding out damaging information, fabricating damaging information, making a combination of damage of fabrication and some element of truth and creating therefore a, a, a possibility of attacking the opponent on this basis and again you also uh, work on the basis of uh, deterrence by having your own, uh, your own um, weapons. There is a wonderful book, depressing but wonderful, uh, by um, Stephen Marks uh, published last year in the United States a title Confessions of a Political Hitman and this is exactly that. He's a political hitman with the Republican Party for 12 years that was absolutely critical in all kinds of uh, elections including bringing down Kerry and other things um, in which he explains how it works and, and how, how he uh, organizes and how the, the, he did and other people did what uh, they call very very professionally opposition research. Um, in fact, in the trade they call themselves something else, but I cannot repeat the word in, 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 in the Knox for environment. Um, uh, so opposition research, which means you find the, the dirt, you mix it so that it's dirtier, uh, and then you take some key bullets from there and you give it to the media experts that then create messages that if they are successful, they can hit uh, very, very um, effectively. You, however, you have to be, it's not that you necessarily uh, reach your goal. This is an art. This is not rocket science. This is an art. For instance, I'm quite sure, uh, knowing this literature, that today's message by the Republican National Committee uh, propagating over the internet an image, uh, a portrait of Obama with the word terrorist, I don't think, today, uh, I don't think is the most effective weapon to bring down Obama at this point. It was two years ago, but not that now. Not now. It may backfire to, to some extent. So, in other words, scandal politics, it's, a, it's relatively undetermined or the effects are delayed. Uh, there is ample evidence that the great uh, uh, adventures of President Clinton in the White House uh, brought discredit to the institution but didn't bring his popularity down. He, he ended as one of the most popular presidents in the history of the United States. However, it brought down the image of morality of his presidency, which was decisive with the number of voters in the Gore election against Bush. And it appeared to have been a delayed effect bringing down Gore, not Clinton, who was already out and people after all they said, well, yeah, sure, he's, he's a crook, has no morality, but uh, has, has been very good in terms of the economic policy, in terms of the foreign policy, so we still love him because, because that's what the survey said. They are all equal, the politicians. In this case, we found out, but they are all equal. And that's what I wanted to say. The real effect of a scandal politics is less the impact of one particular person or then party associated to the person that is hit by the scandal politics. The real effect is on democracy at large. Is everybody is the same, everybody is discredited, we all together go down. That is the critical thing and there there is statistical evidence of the relationship uh, in, uh, in comparative studies throughout the world using the world, uh, the world value survey of the University of Michigan uh, and then uh, measures of corruption. There is a direct relationship between the level of public or published corruption and the, uh, the lack of trust in politics and in democracy. Uh, so, in other words, what media politics and scandal politics are associated with, although they are not by any means the only cause, is with the fundamental crisis of, of legitimacy that has developed all over the world. Um, there are plenty of data out there, you can, you can look at them, 
but um, just to remind you, over 66% uh, of citizens in the world uh, consider that they are not, that the, their country is not governed by the will of the people. And this includes, um, this includes all the Western democracies with the exception of Scandinavia. And um, you have an increasing, over the last 10 years, a decreasing trust, a decreasing trust in uh, politicians and in parties. The, in all the reputational studies, the last institution that people trust, the last one, actually the one that, did not, that they do not trust at all, is political parties. And the last occupation that they appreciate, in fact, the one that they consider most depicable, is politician, systematically in every country of the world. Uh, yes, politicians have never been very popular, in fact, uh, but the trend has accentuated and the, the levels of the crisis of legitimacy are extraordinary. Now, this is not to say that people are depoliticized. That's the other interesting thing. The studies by the World Value Survey and uh, other data sources show that people throughout the world, in fact, have increased their desire of social mobilization and political participation. Uh, they are, all the indicators are up, not down. Uh, yes, uh, Putnam is right that participation in civic associations, in neighborhood block clubs, etc., is down dramatically in the United States and in the world. But that's different from social mobilization, social movement, civic activism of all kinds, which is extraordinarily on the rise, but with no permanent organized forms. So social mobilization and social movements had become disassociated from civic associations and political participation, which therefore, what creates there is extraordinary gap between the formal political system and the political desires, projects, and dreams of people at large. And that's really what I call the crisis of democracy. That's the crisis of democracy. Not simply that people don't believe in democracy, the people believe in their democracy, and they don't believe in the democratic institutions, which is a very serious cognitive dissonance at the world level. Now, therefore, there are increasing um, movements, what I call under power movements, and that fundamentally I am interested in, in, in two varieties of, of, of movements that try to uh, fill the gap of the crisis of legitimacy with alternative projects, uh, alternative values, alternative forms of organizing society in terms of other interests and other values. Always in interaction with the formal politics. It's not a different world, it's a constant interaction between the two. Now, uh, and this one, is what I call social movements, the other is what I call insurgent politics. By social movements, I mean mo movements that are um, directly aimed at changing the values of society. Not to seize power, to change the values, which of course all kinds of consequences follow, but to change the values of society. And by the way, these social movements are not necessarily the nasty, environmental, cute movements we like. Can be, but Fundamentalists, religious fundamentalists, evangelicals, or Islamic, they are social movements. They are social movements. We have to get used to the fact that social movements is not what we like. Social movements is what people decide that are, is what really moves them to change the values of society from wherever they come. And then we can call reactionary or progressive or whatever, but that's already a value judgment. It's not an analytical issue. And if we don't understand the social movement we don't like, uh, we are going to be in trouble because if we only understand what we like and don't understand what we don't like, then we are in danger because exactly that's the, the process that we should be able to, to control. Now, the other is in, what I call insurgent politics. Insurgent politics, I mean uh, processes which start with social mobilization, then challenges the political system as it is, but from within the political system, that therefore tries to translate social movements, social mobilizations, um, alternative projects in um, political projects within the rules and the institutions of the political system. And I think this is different. And of course, there are all kinds of connections between social movements and insurgent politics. But insurgent politics is politics, but not as usual. Right? Now, both, in both cases, they uh, are uh, 
extraordinarily favored in our society by the emergence of what I uh, called some years ago as mass self-communication. Social movements, insurgent parties have to intervene in the construction of the minds, in the battle over the minds in society, also in the communication space. It's not the ones in the television and the others in the backyard. No, they are all in the multiform connected multimedia system. That's where the public mind is formed. So people intervening as agents of change in society also have to go through the same multimedia networks of communication. The same, except that, of course, in different ways. Now, there is a fundamental phenomenon with extraordinary socio-political consequences, which is the fact that we have a new communication system that has increasingly developed and emerged over the last 20 years, but increasingly so, which is simply the, uh, the, the explosion of horizontal networks of communication with much greater autonomy. Just to give you quickly, you know that, but just to fix the ideas, to give you two quick statistics, in terms of internet users worldwide, uh, they the first major study in, uh, in, in 1996, there was about uh, 15 million internet users. Uh, I think it was a little bit more than that because they didn't survey, but certainly not more than 20. Um, now it's 1.4 billion. But more importantly, uh, mobile phone subscribers, not, not devices, not phones, subscribers. In 1991, the first study on that, there were 9 million. Today is 3.6 billion, which if you apply a conservative multiplier factor in terms of use of, of one line by several people, means that over 60% of the world population is connected in some way to uh, the uh, uh, a mobile phone, uh, and therefore the explosion of wireless communication means that not just the developed countries but the entire planet starts being connected and provides the basis for wireless internet, which is of course because the, the fixed lines are not being expanded anymore years ago in, in, in many countries. So the expansion of the internet was blocked at one point because in most of the developing world they have to wait until the development of wireless communication. Now, at this point, neither the business model or <clears throat> the, um, the technology for effective broadband wireless internet is fully diffused. So we are still there, but you can see that the, the, the trend is rapidly integrating the networks of the, the wireless networks of communication in most of the world. I would never say all of the world, but uh, the fundamental divide uh, in the internet nowadays, there is still a divide in terms of quality, in terms of affordability between uh, developed and undeveloped countries. But the fundamental <coughs> divide in the internet is age. Age. Statistically speaking, let's put it clearly. When my generation disappears, there is no more digital divide. Uh, in, in, in advanced countries and much less in, in the uh, developed countries. It's really the ability to, and the, and the sensitivity and the, and, the, and the capacity to use and connect to the internet. Now, but this horizontal uh, system of, of communication has expanded in a form that has increased uh, communication autonomy uh, extraordinarily in terms of blocks, uh, just to give you one one illustration, uh, there is a new blog every second in the world and 1.2 million new blog posts every each, each day. Um, and, and this gives, and it, the, the number is doubling every seven months. Uh, yes, most of the blogs are what I call electronic autism, um, but because people write for themselves and from their mamas, fundamentally. Uh, but still, according to the, the, the few studies uh, that are on the matter, about 32%, according to the Pew Institute, uh, are communicating, organizing with other people. Well, 32% of 110 million is still significant. Or the 100 million videos on YouTube and the constant posting on YouTube, on Facebook, the social spaces like MySpace and many others, 
has created not a virtual society, has created a virtual space which has become our real society, connected certainly to everything we do in life and therefore a hybrid space which has magnified the autonomous capacity to set up a communication system by passing uh, the controls of both business and government, by and large. If you want to discuss control by government, we can do it later, not to cut the argument. Um, of course, corporations also are in the same space. These are not separate spaces. Anything that, that exists is also under the influence of uh, corporate power in the world. Uh, the largest website uh, in terms of visits in the world is BBC. The second largest, well, the largest actually are Google and Yahoo, but that doesn't count because these are uh, portals to other things. The largest is BBC, the second uh, largest is uh, New York Times, and the third largest is CNN. Uh, so it's clear that, that they are there. However, the fact that the virtual space, that the cyber space is populated by everything and everybody who exists on the planet, of course, doesn't eliminate the fundamental fact that people can set up their own networks of collaboration, people can set up their own possibilities of relating and bypass the controls that existed previously. And that's the only thing I want to say. Now, this has generated all kinds of uh, actions that show the connection, the direct connection between mass self-communication, uh, I call mass because it's mass, has reached a global audience, I call, I call self because it's self-generated, self-directed, self-retrieved, self-organized. Um, and the ability to organize counter-power, both social movements and insurgent politics, has dramatically increased in this matter. An example of of the, uh, how social movements are, um, had transformed uh, their landscape in that sense can be uh, found in movements such as the Global Environmental Movement. Uh, I did in the book, there's a study of the emergence of the, uh, the rise of consciousness, of global consciousness on global warming and climate change. 30 years ago, we had the scientific data, the same scientific, well, not the same, the same hypothesis with solid data. Uh, now we have 95% certainty uh, that, that not only that is happening, that is human made. But um, we didn't have the consciousness. Uh, one can trace back to the development of environmental movement, particularly in the UK. The UK has been very important in that sense to um, create a public mind which at this point means that about 80% of people know about it in the planet, in the planet, and 60% think it is very important and should be a priority for governments, which therefore prompts uh, action in terms of policy making uh, by uh, UN conferences, governments, even Bush wanted to now take on, on climate change. He probably is thinking about retirement in Florida or Texas, so that's, uh, but, but Everybody now is for climate change. Everybody, there's no cleavage anymore. Uh, about 10, well, no, one person, I, I would not do politics, it's not for climate, for controlling climate change. But most, most people now accept that. Well, that was a, a social movement changing the values of society, putting the, the, the transformation of our productive system, because that is what it is, and, and asking for a priority in terms of how we organize our life in this planet which, by the way, the planet has no problem. The planet is okay. It's we in the planet. That's a different thing. We are not destroying the planet. We are destroying ourselves in the planet, uh, the livability of the planet. Um, so this is a social movement that has essentially worked on impacting the media, organizing environmental uh, action networks, uh, debating on the internet, connecting information on the internet, receiving donations on the internet, organizing movements, at the local level through global networks on the internet. That's a, a clear evidence on the matter. Another one is the so-called anti-globalization movement, which is an, an entirely internet-based movement, which has prompted a debate on the, the means and goals of globalization and has really transformed in many countries the consciousness about what is or should be or is not globalization, again. And we could go on and on 
of all these social movements, which are, have one characteristic. They are locally based, globally connected. They are local and global at the same time. They are global networks. But networks, remember, is, are made of nodes, and these nodes are local. Insurgent politics. Um, in traditional theory of political communication, political influence to the media was largely determined by the interaction between the political elites and professional journalists. And so media acted and act as gatekeepers of information and so they shape the public mind, the public opinion. But things have changed. Uh, one of the major um, traditional thinkers in, in, in the communication field, Elihu Katz, wrote a seminal article in 1997 emphasizing the transformation of the media environment that, uh, uh, that had been analyzed by political communication, showing that the fragmentation of the audience and the increasing control that new communication technologies give to the consumers of the media have uh, altered the landscape of political communication. And he emphasized the growing role of online multimodal social networking. Now, this has transform the practice of politics. Not so much of traditional formal politics, not so much, which uh, continue to use the internet as a billboard and continue to use the internet simply to contact citizens, be good, vote for me, and that's it. Uh, and fundamentally, give information. And that shows us one uh, lesson from the history of technology. You can have the best technology in the world and the newest technology in the world, if you don't adapt, if this technology is not adapted to the goals and interests of a given social organization, it will not be used, period. So if you have a political system that is predicated on absence of political participation, limited information to the citizens, and professionalization of politics in the hands of the elites, no great interest in using the internet for that. But the internet fundamentally is interactive and is building autonomy. So you're not interested in too much interactivity or allowing the capacity of citizenship to be autonomous. You are not that much interested because that would bypass the traditional establishment of media politics. The use of the internet, yes, you will lose the internet because you want to be modern and you are in the internet world, etc. But you are not going to exploit the capabilities of internet, which again is not simply a communication system, it's an interactive autonomous communication system. And that is the, what is specific to the internet. Otherwise, you use the internet as television or mobile phones as television. So insurgent politics has dramatically uh, been transformed in the last 10 years in the world uh, by the uses of new communication technologies. Uh, two main points, one the headline and another a more detailed analysis on which I, I will end the lecture. Um, what I call um, resistant practices or instant communities of practices have become a form of insurgent politics throughout the world to protest indignity, to protest abu abuse of power with tremendous impacts on the actual conduct of politics, changing governments, changing regimes, etc. I refer to uh, instant mobilizations trigger spontaneously or quasi-spontaneously over mobile phone networks on the basis of protesting against certain events. Social movements of all kinds. The most famous one, which has been studied repeatedly now, is the one in Spain in 2004, in which the manipulation of information by the Spanish government, the conservative Spanish government, about the authorship of the uh, uh, terrorist attacks in, 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 in Madrid, um, blaming the Basque terrorists when in fact everybody knew it was Al-Qaeda uh, because in that way elections coming four days later the government would not be blamed for its participation in the Iraq war on the side of uh, Bush. Um, the government lied, waiting, hoping for the possibility that in four days they would discover the, the evidence but in the meantime the elections would have happened. Uh, and for a number of circumstances that I can they tell you you are interested uh, the media couldn't say much and the political parties couldn't say anything. 
Young people, by themselves, the last day before the election, started a mobile network uh, with simply asking people with a, one small message, well, a small SMS, going to demonstrate, denouncing what uh, was happening. Now, two things about this. This kind of mobile phone mobilization are extremely effective because the, net, the networks you form, they are instant networks, but which kind of networks? It's the small world phenomenon in network theory. Is you receive the message from your friend, from someone you know. You, you send to your address book, which is 10 people, and the 10 people send to 10 people, and they send the 10, no, but they are not uh, anonymous people. They are the people who you know. So you open the message, and then you, and you trust the message. Uh, little footnote on that, Berlusconi didn't know that, and two months after this, this, uh, this phenomenon in Spain said, huh, I'm going to be a, as a smart, not, not my, like my friend at now, I'm going to be a smarter. I had elections, I, the, the, the polls are bad, I'm going to send a personal message to every cell phone of every citizen in Italy. And he sent 15 million messages, and that of course backfired completely, because nothing uh, people hate more than having the, the intimacy of their cell phone, which is really an extension of yourself, uh, invaded by the prime minister the day of the election. That, so the people <laughs> were reacting. So this is not, you know, that not understanding network theory has real consequences. Um, so that movement in, in Spain ultimately led to something uh, significant, which was young people usually don't vote, as in many countries, for the reasons that, that we know. And, and usually don't vote, and certainly don't vote for socialists. They, vote, they don't vote conservative, but they don't vote socialists either. That day, uh, two million new voters came in and voted massively for the socialists with the slogan, let's get the liars out. So not we like socialists. Many of them in the, in the interviews, they said that they closed their nose voting for the socialists, but the idea was to get the liars out. So that was important, but we have studied social movements of this type, instant mobilization throughout the world uh, in terms of uh, in Ecuador, in Ukraine, in France, in, 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 in the Philippines, in Korea. Uh, this is a really important new phenomenon. Why is important? Because you can transform an instant indignation in an instant social mobilization with a specific targets and effects. This is resistance but resistance in terms of insurgent politics. Not necessarily building a political movement, but creating a political uh, process. <coughs> then, insurgent politics in terms of alternative forms of politics that penetrate the political system. And here, I will finish by referring, and then I will have one minute uh, conclusion, referring to the Obama campaign. I did a very detailed uh, statistical and ethnographic study of the primary campaign of Obama in the United States with my student Amelia Arsenault, my student Lauren Mobius. We did this study uh, and I would like to, to, to dwell one five minutes on, on this, trying to explain the key factors and how this relates to the dynamics of insurg insurgent politics through the media space and through the communication system. Of course, uh, it is insurgent politics but for the very simple reason. Insurgent politics means that you create, you bring in new actors into the system and you bring in new alternatives into the system that were not in the cards of the system. You, you are within the system but with a political project and political actors that are new into the system. You take Barack Obama, he was the most unlikely nominee that you can think of. If two years ago I would stand here and tell you or tell myself that could be President of the United States, a guy that was an African-American race partly in Indonesia with the name Barack Hussein Obama, you would throw me out and, 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 and call actually the psychiatric institution. Um, and more than that, he actually won the nomination by bringing in huge amounts of new political actors. Actually, nine million new voters have registered in the United States, of which, of course, the majority uh, registered by the Obama campaign. We don't know what they're going to vote, but we can guess. Um, now, 
this is what I, I try to say. This is not a revolutionary guy by any means, but he's an unlikely candidate for all these other reasons. And although he is certainly very moderate and very pragmatic, he has the most liberal record of voting in the Senate. And as you know, in the United States, you say liberal, and someone shoots you immediately. Uh, so he is a, a, a liberal. I mean, he is trying to play around that, but his record as this is the only real thing that McCain is, uh, has targeted him well, his record is the most liberal in, in the Senate. So all things together uh, was an impossible, an impossible task. So how, how, what, what, what actually happened? Here are the keys, empirically speaking, I mean, measured with, with the data that we could collect. First, the candidate himself. Um, everybody uses the same word, inspirational, new, which means fundamentally he was in politics, but was not politics as usual. That, that's very important. And he, because of who he was, he gave credibility to his message. His message is concentrated in two words, change and hope, opposed to Continuity, meaning establishment politics. Some, some people use continuity, others just simply was establishment politics, plus experience. Experience was very important in the, in the primary campaign. Hillary was readiness, experience. Obama was change and hope. So that, now, words are extremely important. Why? Because words construct metaphors. That's just, just, just lake of analysis. And metaphors happen to be the way our brain thinks. Our brain thinks in metaphors. So if you set up the metaphors that connect to the metaphors in our brain and you touch the right buttons, we have a stock of metaphors. The problem is how outside messages connect to this set of metaphors. You co connect to the, to the right ones, then you win. In the mind. So means what? Readiness, experience, to people sounded like, okay, but things are going to be the same. Now you say change and you should hope, you, ha you should have hope and believe that you can change. That's what people were thinking. I need to change. This is going down. So uh, you see, in that sense, uh, the, the, the message and the, and the characteristics of the candidate appear to, there's some interesting linguistic analysis on, on that. Uh, there were also there was also a um, particular one one political uh, fact that is important to 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 say. It was the early Obama opposition to the Iraq War. That was that was important in in 2002 in a context in which both Republicans and Democrats were supporting the Iraq War. So the huge amount of people who were mm, disgusted by by the war. Uh, so that as a sign of something different. Because Hillary also didn't like the war, was not. But he, she was thinking presidential campaigns. She, she was thinking, I'm going to be president, so I need for that not to be clearly anti-war. I, I have to support the war and then twist things around. Obama had nothing to lose, in addition to maybe he, that's what he thought. <clears throat> so he, he took position uh, against the war early on, and that helped him. Uh, then the target audience, Obama from the beginning targeted one audience, the young people, the young people who were the ones who were disaffected politically, who simply don't vote. To give you a figure, in the, in the primaries of 2004, only 8% of eligible people under uh, 30 voted. In this Last campaign, 25%. So huge differences in it. And then, of course, minorities, particularly African American, they, he didn't say he didn't have to target anything. <laughs> his, his personal message, his body uh, was, uh, was the message. So he didn't have to, to say anything. But these two disaffected groups mobilized massively in, in, in unprecedented uh, terms. I must tell you that today's analysis of the first results on early voting in the United States uh, project, according to some political scientists, 
a rate of participation way over 65%. That would be the historic record in the United States and coming essentially for newly registered voters. Then more specifically, and how we come into the communication now, <coughs> a fundamental tool of the Obama campaign was the ability to organize grassroots, the communities, following the methods that 40 years ago were developed by Saul Alinsky uh, in Chicago uh, and that uh, Obama actually experienced because he was for five years a community activist in the, uh, in the neighborhoods of Chicago and act, literally worked with the Alinskites of Chicago uh, who were uh, financed by the Catholic Church as Alinsky was and they continue to be. So what Obama did is to have a very strong grassroots effort, neighborhood by neighborhood throughout the country, all the states, all 50 states, and then bring it into the internet, and that's the critical thing. Not just local work, but brought it into the internet, creating websites connected to every effort everywhere, and connecting people throughout the country over the internet, and constantly interacting from each local chapter uh, in the uh, internet system. So it is not the internet, it's not the grassroots, it's the combination between the internet and the grassroots organized by a very professional campaign of very young people. Very young people who knew the internet, knew how to work in the internet uh, and how to do it. However, the mother of all politics continues to be money, not ideology not sponsoring, money. So how Obama did it? He used the internet and he used the fact that he had created a movement. Obama has broken all historic records of money in a campaign. Overall, overall, $600 million. Now, the, the fact that the Republican Party and McCain are running because they don't have money. And Obama is taking the luxury of paying whatever. Where it comes from? He started by doing a fundamental thing, which is very good tactically, not only ideologically. He rejected any money from any lobbies, explicitly. By doing so, he attracted the people who say, good, we are not going to be dependent on the lobbies. So he built trust and credibility by doing so, exactly. And then, he built a movement uh, with the idea that you pay today, you know, put a little money on the side for the future of your children, $25 a month, $50 a month. So he ended up, the, the, the latest statistic, with three million donors with an average donation of $200. Well, multiply. <laughs> it is $600 million. Uh, for those of you who, who don't know the American system, you can donate, each individual can donate up to a maximum of 2,300 in the primary and 2,300 in the general election. So people could even donate, have donated 4,600. Very few people did that because most people, students, young people, uh, African-American, didn't have that kind of money. But everybody put whatever they could and ended up with 3 million putting <coughs> an average $200 million. So he replaced the power of the money with the money of the powerless. And, and, and that, that is a, a, it's a good tactic. I don't know how sincere it is, but I can, I can tell you that it really worked. And then the media. Very important. The media <coughs> propelled Obama in many ways. But not so much because they supported Obama. That's not correct. But because, remember the rule, that's the media are business. The key is sell. That's what they have to do. Now, instead of a boring, established campaign, suddenly they had a great narrative, a great story. The, the, the poor black guy coming from nowhere, but Harvard Law School, uh, African-American, uh, new in politics, 
uh, mobilizing the youth against the good established woman and addition woman so black versus a woman <laughs> that's really interesting it's a great script it's a great script and then horse race politics ah he's she is going to win the moment that she started to lose in Iowa they got the narrative aha uh -huh, she's not going to win so easily no but then she comes back then he counterattacks. then she comes back with the Latinos and the women so the narrative had everybody fixed like a soap opera for months and months and months and, until, until June. Therefore, everybody got to know Obama and, and Hillary as a soap opera character, the most popular soap opera in America. Um, so therefore, the, both knew how to go into the media and then feed in the media all the time, etc. But I would say the most important ability for Obama to deal with the media and the communication um, um, strategy was when he saved himself from absolute catastrophe. Everybody following the campaign in our interviews, etc., thought that after the videos of Reverend Wright, that some interesting guy in ABC News decided to put on the uh, on, YouTube, on, on ABC News and then on YouTube, etc. After that, he was finished. He was finished. How after those videos, and not renouncing to his mentor and maintaining that he was his mentor, how he could survive that? That, that was what, uh, uh, for everybody that we have talked in terms of the experts in communication, thought that that was the moment in which some magic happened. Which magic? The guy was lost. That was a devastating blow. That's a scandal politics, attack politics. He was finished. He simply decided to take it, he interrupted his campaign, went to work for a weekend, um, and tried to explain to the country. Trying to explain to the country uh, what is the why, where this rage comes from. Why a good guy, a Marine, a Marine, a decorated Marine from Vietnam. A uh, good theologian was well considered in the theology circles that Clinton, the, Obama didn't use that, but Clinton had called this guy, this reverend, together with 10 others uh, in the moment when he decided to repent from his, from his Monica sins uh, to the White House to pray with him. So how this guy could in certain sermons, selected by Bill Clips, of course, how could, he could say these outrageous things? And then he went, rather than saying, no, no, that's manipulation, the video clips are not correct. No, he went into the roots of rage of black liberation theology. And what impacted people most was that, you know, I have been there. I have been with my grandmother, white, going into the streets of Hawaii. And when my grandmother was seeing me, uh, sorry, was seeing a black man in the street, Buddhists start to shake out of fear. And then suddenly Buddhists stop and look at me, and would get lost. Well, that moment, he transformed the whole atmosphere, suddenly people started to think, you know? So what I'm trying to say is not how Obama, how great is Obama, but how technically he was able to survive an attack by reestablishing a message of the background, providing the background of that particular speech, of that particular reverend. Of course, when after that, the reverend went on and decided to be a celebrity himself and started to do all kinds of a stupid uh, uh, statements, then Obama then, at that point, okay, if that's the case, uh, you're out. I, I am not anymore in your life. I go out of your church, etc., etc. But first, when the notion was what, why this guy would say these things, Obama would be associated, he explained. And suddenly, the, but he explained emotionally to the point that in the last months in many schools of the United States, children are discussing uh, this Obama speech on, on race relations. So again, communication. Communication, reacting to communication, engaging communication rather than gimmicks of communication. So um, the, certainly the, the, the fact that he... Um, that he is uh, uh, the, the nominee and that he may, 
is like, is likely to be the president of the United States, means that um, he, when they are through it's insurgent politics, and in insurgent politics you always have a mechanism which is people filling the dots of what they want. Obama had many ambiguous sentences, uh, deliberately. And because he's ambiguous, that's another thing if you're interested, there's a whole theory of ambiguity about Obama. But people fill in the dots, and everybody put in what they wanted. So that's how you have a, a person propel uh, into the leader of a movement. When he becomes the conveyor of everything that we want, and then we put on that, well, of, you know where this goes, uh, to total disappointment and total deception afterwards. Not because he will betray whatever, but because he certainly, in the reality of the presidency, they, he, can, he will not be able to fulfill all these dreams, projections, possibilities that everybody has, and particularly in the crisis we have. So we are in for a round of, of, of terrible feelings about huh, Obama is like the others. If this happens, of course, will be a tremendous crisis of uh, legitimacy and trust in, into the system. But I was trying to show you the mechanism about how insurgent politics and how a particular communication process can transform the, um, in, in many ways the political system. So my uh, basic point is that uh, the communication space, that communication is the field of power making. The communication space has been transformed both by technology and the restructuring of business and the media. Um, because of that, new f one of the things that has happened is that this space in the network society, the space of communication, is more pervasive than ever in history because we all live in a network hypertext of communication. In that space, one of the things that has happened is to increase the possibility, just the possibilities of uh, the um, uh, intervention in autonomous terms by people, by social actors, by grassroots movements, by social movements, and by insurgent politics. It doesn't mean that there's freedom. It means that there are greater chances, greater possibilities. At the same time, because of that, business powers, political powers, have understood the need to control also the horizontal uh, networks of communication, also to play the politics of internet. Now it has become too important. And therefore, we have all the attempts to censor the internet, we have all the attempts to use um, internet users as potential pirates and cheaters, uh, we have the debate on net neutrality because the owners of the internet infrastructure are trying to uh, appropriate the infrastructure for the, to the service of their clients and customers. So we have a major, a major um, political battle and business battle for the control of the internet. And so the most important practical conclusion of my analysis is that the autonomous construction of meaning can only proceed by preserving the commons of communication networks made possible by the internet, a free creation of freedom lovers. This will not be an easy task because the power holders in the network society must, to be in power, must enclose free communication in commercialized and police networks in order to close the public mind by programming the connection between communication and power. However, to end on a different note, the public mind, we know, is constructed by networking individual minds, such as yours. Thus, if you think differently, if you think differently, communication networks will operate differently, on one condition, that is not only you, but I, and a multitude who choose to build the networks of our lives. Thank you.